Hello and welcome to the ID show at Stanford University. Today our topics are why no one is talking about masturbation, are students following their own dreams or the dreams of their parents, and do countries need borders? Hi guys, my name is Adi. I'm from India and I study in IHM. Hi guys, my name is Miova and I'm from Zambia and I'm studying international business management. Hi, my name is Aida. I'm from Namibia and I'm studying international business management. Hello, my name is Yasi. I'm from Iran. My major is management management. Hi everyone, I'm Zach and I am from America and I am currently studying uh, journalism and broadcast at Stanford University. It relieves anxiety, helps you sleep, and boosts your sex life. Why are we not talking about masturbation? Let's hand it over to our host today. What do you guys think? <laughs> the dead silence. It's the panel. No one said a word. Okay. Ten minutes of no one speaking. Adi, <laughs> you talk since you don't find it awkward. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, it's... Uh, I'm gonna be straight up clear over here. I do this every day. I need it, <laughs> right? It helps me think. So in my in my personal experience, masturbation has been this kind of thing for me, where it, like when I'm stressed or when right. I'm really really, really tired, it helps me give this boost of energy. Uh, Don't know about you girls, but us guys, we can easily just do it in a quick minute or two. But why do we think it's a taboo topic? That's the main like for for me. Why I think this topic is important. It's not just just, oh, we're talking about masturbation. Yeah, yeah. It's really because a lot of people don't, a lot of parents aren't talking to their kids about sex. Mm -hmm. And if they are talking to them, the conversations that they're having are not always exploring all of the options that young people have. And so I think that it's important that we sort of talk about it and maybe hopefully sit, like explain to people that it's okay and that it's natural. But what are your guys' experiences with how you were told about Sex or masturbation. masturbation. Did you did, did you learn about it in school? I'm sorry. Did you learn about it in school or, or your parents or? We just find it out ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly. Like, yeah. Because in our religion, masturbation is a sin. Yeah. And then no one. The thing is, no one wants to talk about it. Even our parents find it like so awkward to talk about it to us because they think it's a sin. So if they talk about it and we're going to like. See, okay, what is masturbation? Are we going to try it? Then we're going to become a sin. Right. Yeah. That's what I think in Islam is like that because I'm Muslim, but like even in Christianity is also like that. Right. Yeah. It is a sin. And I think most parents don't talk to their kids about it because it's just generally uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable yeah. conversation. Right. So I think a lot of people just find out about sex through like conversations with their friends or like school and to add to that I think that the way that most of the um, young people like most people find about out about this is they have not that the wrong conversations and that's how they find out about it yeah. so they don't have the conversation based on let's educate each other they have the conversation on what I did last night right. or the two weeks ago and that's how the conversation starts yeah. and just to add to it I think parents don't talk about this with their children because of I just feel like the relationship is not where it's supposed to be if you can't talk to your child about certain topics, it just means that yeah, there's something you have to work on. Because later at the, at the end of the day, it's going to be that the child was not educated properly and they're obviously going to try and do, you know, experiment with it. Right. That's true. Plus, I don't, I, in my opinion, I don't feel it's the parents' fault. I feel it's the society's fault for this not being such a mainstream idea or topic. Because in society, if you talk about sex or anything related to sex, you're classified under the term as slutty or something like that. Especially in women's case, that's why they tend to be more secretive about these things. Also, other factors like you know um, your age group, what yeah. your your hormones, your puberty. Sometimes people find out on their own, like you know. But in women's case, this is not a thing. Like you know, when guys go to puberty, you get you start getting erections and all that. But for women, you don't get erections because. 
Well, it's happen. different anatomy. Yeah, it's and, different anatomy. And I think that it actually puts kids and young adults at a disadvantage because if no one's talking to you about it, um, I was researching reasons why parents should educate their kids about yeah. um, sex and masturbation and the three reasons that I found were that it shows support for their ability and need to be able to talk about sex because kids want to, I feel that like with my parents, I, I would have been totally open to them speaking to me about sex and masturbation, but my parents never spoke to me about that. Yeah. So, and I felt in some way like, well, why aren't we having this conversation? Do they, do they yeah. not feel that I'm like ready for it? Or it's like almost like a maturity thing. Mm -hmm. And then the second reason was to help ensure that they will be emotionally prepared. Because like we're saying a lot of times, the first time that you have a sexual encounter, if you haven't had, like myself, if I didn't have any sex education, then it's happening and you don't have any education, so you, like afterwards, I was so freaked out about it because I had never had any conversation about what it was and things like that. And then the last reason was to communicate better with partners because if you're not comfortable, you know, you have to know what's happening to know if you're comfortable with it, in my opinion. Because if you don't know what, what's happening, then how are you able to like tell the person this is okay, this is not this okay, is not which is very important, <laughs> especially these days. I mean, there was this recent statistics regarding the sex education and how well-educated children are in American high schools around the country. And states that were predominantly Catholic or Christian and were in which uh, masturbation and sex is a crime before marriage. So in those states, teen pregnancies were out of the charts. Yeah. So like, it's kind of like, you know, you're trying to repress something in, in, the, in the name of being pure and holy. But people want to know what it is because, you know, it's biology. It comes intrinsically. And then they're going to try out and they're going to make mistakes. If we educated them in advance, their life could have been so much better. They could have done it the right way. And to add to that, it's like, uh, yes, like in, in some parts, people get educated about this. But I just feel like uh, the focus on who should be educated is it's so focused on the female and the male is left out. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I mean, there was, uh, there was this one statistic that I also read, it said that uh, a, a woman can only fall pregnant every nine months, mm -hmm. but a man can impregnate every day. So <laughs> who should be getting education on safe sex and teenage pregnancy? So the focus should not only be on the female, yeah. but it's time that the this takes a turn and both get the same um, for education and you know just the, something just has to be done and not just the female because when you look at it when it comes to teenage pregnancy it's always why didn't she keep her leg closed why didn't yeah. she do that why didn't she Society say no why didn't he keep his legs closed why didn't he <laughs> say no you know so yeah. that's such a good point yeah. Yeah, and on, on the best countries to compare this to, like uh, United States has a huge problem of this. The country to compare this to is Norway or you know the um, northern side of Europe, where usually sex is um, usually done at the age of 16, or, whereas the international age is 18. And the thing is, parents usually know when their child is having sex for the first time. There was apparently in psychology class we were studying this and. Apparently, most children's first times are usually done in their house with their parents being in the house too. They're not watching, but they just know their child is having sex. It shows like a sign of trust, like you know, you're not curbing your growth, you're letting you do what you want, but it also shows that there's protection involved, as you know, parents know what they're doing, and they can give them advice on how to, like you know, use a condom, use birth control. So you know, this trust factor is really needed in between, you know, parents and children. And especially after a certain age, you cannot be treated as a child anymore. You need to be treated as an adult. And this, the thing is, where I'm from, they don't tell you, like, use a condom. Like, your parents don't yeah. have those kind of conversations yeah. with you. So they only say, don't do it. Yes. Yeah. So, because yes. once they're like, use a condom, it's like, we're giving you the free ticket. Yeah. Exactly. So, we're just not going to give you the free ticket and be like, don't do it. It's just, don't do it. Yeah. But then that actually makes people want to do it more yeah, exactly. like, why, why I should I do this so the first time I came to know about sex was through like Indian yeah. mythology you know Kama Sutra right yeah. Yeah. our country is based on it yeah and people in our country are scared to talk about it so that says a lot about how people have changed over time mm -hmm. there's this saying in India Lokya Sochenge that means 
what will people think? Exactly. And that's the main thing. Society is a thing exactly. that is stopping our growth. Hmm. We want to be so good in front of the eyes of others, we don't realize what we have to be. For, uh, for ourselves. Yeah. So, Yasin, to pivot off of that point, do you think that abstinence is a realistic expectation for young people? Because I've, a lot of people at the table have mentioned that that's the expectation of parents a lot of the time, is that their children stay abstinent. And like Aina was saying, if they give the kid the condom, it's almost like they're endorsing that, oh, okay, now you can go out and have sex. Do you feel that it's realistic to expect kids to it's be not. abstinent? It's like sex and masturbation, everyone doing it. Right. But some people are open to talk about it, some people are not. Like, uh, I, just, I just want to add this, when I was grade 8, I grew up in Dubai and it was a like diverse country, it's a lot of people from different religions, mm -hmm. different countries there. I still remember uh, on my biology book, they came on the first day and took out the oh, sexual wow. part, chapter. Oh. Yeah, because they don't want us to see it, and then maybe we want to try it or something because it's an Islamic country. Oh, okay. But again, even if, if it's an Islamic country, in the holy book of yours or mine, yeah. this thing it's something. It's there. It's, it's not part of the life. Procreate in the future is like, oops, I'm finding my yeah, way. Yeah, they to come do it. and took it off. But after like. But we all know what was it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we all know which like, pages they took out. We literally know what was it. And does, it, does so, the internet as well. Like, internet is, is there. You just don't need so. to like teach us. We already exactly. know yeah. before. Like, but yeah, it's. I think parents just don't feel comfy to talk about it yeah. because of their background. Like my friend, she's from Germany. She was so open to talk about it and all, but I, like. I'm so I'm so like close to my parents, but still, maybe in my mentality, um, I cannot talk about this kind of things yeah. to them. But like, yeah, if they tell us like what we should do during sex or after sex, it would have be better. Yeah. Actually, I was watching this documentary yesterday. Oh. It was about uh, South Korea, which at the moment is one of the countries that they are so open about this topic. But still. Uh, it's like there are so many teenager girls committed suicide because of the teen um, pregnancy mm -hmm. and then I think it's not a if the parents talk about it then that wouldn't happen right. and I have a sense just, of, oh go ahead oh just to add to that um, I don't know if uh, abstaining from it is the solution but it's not wrong to tell your children don't do it but whether don't do it, at least tell them if someday you know it happens and you could, you can do this. Use a condom. You can go to the pharmacy. You can buy this for afterwards, just to, you know, not experience the teenage pregnancy and so on. Just for to stay safe, and because I mean there are a lot of things that our parents tell us not to do, but up to a certain age you don't do it, and then you just one day you know society. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. peer pressure and everything plays a role so we don't live in an envir environment where abstaining from it is so easy but we live in an environment where there is a solution for everything if you just teach them this is the way out this is the way forward if things go wrong yeah exactly. and I think that people get confused between education and advocacy and like telling somebody that they oh yeah now you can go and have sex yeah like there's a difference you can educate someone about okay, this is how the, your body works and this is what sex is, while also if it's your belief that the child shouldn't be or that your teenager shouldn't be having sex, you can still relay that message. It doesn't have to be one or the other, and right. that's my perspective. Because at some point, parents are not going to have to. Because regardless, nature is going to go its way. You cannot stop it from happening. One day in the future, you're probably going to find someone and you're probably going to have sex with him or her. Yeah. So it's better to tell them how you can have it safely unless you want to create a child. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like where I'm from, abortion is like yeah. oh, a oh, sin, oh, and like it's right. a crime as well. Yeah. And like because parents aren't talking to their children about sex, you know, so if a teenager gets pregnant, their automatic response to it is abortion. So like I think to avoid those kind of things, parents should talk to their children about like right. sex, like what you should do if you get into this type of situation, the pill you should take, you know, those type of things need to be talked about to avoid 
abortion, to avoid like suicide. So because yes. we can keep parents can keep telling this is a sin, this is this is a sin, but there are a lot of things out there now for yeah. us that are like religion. There are a lot of things out there that are sin, but we still commit it. So what is going to be the thing not to okay? I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do this. You know, someday you're just gonna slip and it happens. Well, yeah, we're all human. So <laughs> um, there are like in a lot of countries because parents are not talking to their kids, and once it happened to them, they don't know what exactly it is. They think like it's something normal. They cannot understand the actual pleasure of having sex. Yeah. And in so many countries, like when uh, like Afghanistan, I watched a documentary. It's like a 12 years old getting married, and then but the parents is not going to tell the right. kid like what's going to happen, happen to you in the like once you get married. So that happened when that happened to them. They start hating the actual. Sex, they start hitting you because it's so painful. They don't yeah, know what exactly yeah, yeah. it is, and they cannot yeah. actually be pleasure. And yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing parents talk about. Absolutely, that's why masturbation is the safest method of sex. Nobody mm -hmm. gets pregnant. Well, that's right. It <laughs> is the safest kind of sex. And I think that we've been able to establish from this conversation that it really is important for a lot of different reasons for parents to be speaking about sex with their children. Thank you. So every week at Stanford University, we do a poll with the students to find out what kind of topics they're really interested in. And this week, one of the most popular topics was about whether or not students are following their own dreams or the dreams that their parents have for them. I'm going to open up the discussion to our hosts. What do you guys think? So this topic, uh, I, was, I was talking to a few people. And I told them about, okay, they saw it on the ID show, and I was telling them about this. And then later on, because uh, last week, I was part of the IT competition, or the app competition. So when I told them everything that I'm doing, they're like, are you confused with what you have to do? And I was just like, no, I'm not. But certainly, if I have to change my major now, my dad's really going to be <laughs> So, and then they were like, are you sure you're following your own dream? Or are you following your dad's dream? But I'm sure I'm following my own dream. But this is where this topic really came. Because then I thought of a lot of other students out there. Because like back in my country, if you have to look, most of the careers that are really recognized is like engineering, medicine, law. Yeah, right. So I feel like the younger generation, they, they are pressured to go into these careers because it's what their parents want. If you're like, now I'm going to do journalism, they're just going to be like, why? Honestly, it doesn't make money, <laughs> it doesn't make it money. Make it doesn't, money. it's not going to get you there. Exactly. But it's not always about the money. It's about what you're passionate about and what you're going to do effectively and what you're going to enjoy when you decide to choose a career. So, so yeah, that's really... Uh, you see, I think um, a lot of people do follow their parents' dreams. For example, in my country, there are a lot of people that are passionate about music, about like dance, like you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But they look at the things like, what kind of career am I gonna have? You know, so and we don't have like the schools that like universities that you can go to to actually, you know, that like college of the arts. Yeah, college sense. of the arts. So like they just end up going with what their parents want them to do. And I've got friends that actually are doing what their parents want them to do, and they're twins. And both of them are studying medicine because their parents oh. want them studying And it's like some parents are like, if you don't do this, yeah. then, then you should find like, someone yeah. to pay for your tuition. Which, which it's not. It's not right. Yeah. You see, well, they're, sorry. Sorry, they're interested in like business, oh. but their parents are like, want them to study medicine, right. and those are complete opposite Different, yeah. well, things. I'm from a country like India, where there are only three things you can be if you're a man. That's a doctor, an engineer, or an IT expert. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a female, there are only two things you can be: a doctor or a housewife. housewife. That's sad, because our parents are from a generation where things weren't as vast as it is right now. They only knew knew two, three things that worked, and they saw it working for people earning a lot of money. The world is really different right now. Plus, it's not only the parents; it's the education system that's baked like this. It's been thoroughly baked in this. If you see the education system right now, I don't think they emphasized enough on 
how a student should be taught, it's what the student should be taught. They tell you, study science, study business, study math, but and then they give music as like one subject in a week. Or like an uh, optional, optional, free, exactly. you know, as something that you can do just for free, exactly. or like just something like Plus, that. Plus, at that age, so many times the facilities are available for people to pursue their passions. Like, you know, let's say, hey, I want to go into Olympics. So many people want to go in sports and want to go in Olympics, but they do not have the um, opportunities or the facilities available to, you know, do what they want. If yeah. someone wants to go to javelin throwing, but it's not there around them, how are they going to do it? And then comes the cost of pricing and all that. Yeah. And the thing that, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> my personal experience, I still remember when I wanted to do my IGCSE. Mm -hmm. Since I was a kid, I love art. And I'm really good in art. Mm. And when I, in the IGCSE, I was like, Mom, Dad, I want to take art. They said, No, you should take physics. Because <laughs> yeah. there is no future for art. Yeah. And then once you're done, you can just do art like next to your getting yeah. a degree. Yeah. And then when you come to the university, and I'm like, I want to go for design things, I want to go for fashion design, interior design. And then my father said, only finance or accounting? Then I was like, okay, I'm not saying I hate finance or accounting, yeah. but, but I, I love art. It's like, else, my passion yeah. is art. Then after a few years, like I started drawing myself, I started painting, and they were like, wow, that's so good. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my I've God. been telling you since yeah. I was a kid. And then, and then, my, but my father still said, like, okay, it's either finance or accounting, or I'm not going to pay. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go for finance. <laughs> and then later on, I'm like, I don't understand finance. It's yeah. like, the yeah. teacher was talking, and I was just looking at my hand, and I was like, okay, this one is more interesting. There's a <laughs> line. And I'll, so I was like, okay, I'm going to change it to logistic. Otherwise, I just don't yeah, want to do it. Thing, uh, like you said, you that there's no future for art. Mm -hmm. They so like there are say, a lot of people who are unemployment. But my thing know? is, how is there going to be a future if you guys keep uh, declining the future? How many uh, children and young people out there want to pursue or they want to go do fashion? How is that industry going to develop if we are not allowing them to start to form the foundation mm -hmm. for others to build upon. If if you keep saying uh, there's no f future for it, you know, I believe that uh, you speak life and death into things. So if you're going to keep saying there's no future, then there's not going to be a future because you've already spoken the word and it's done. So yeah. we should, instead of not, instead of saying that it's not going to be there, parents should help form this industry, form this new um, seek to so that it can develop for the future, for the next generation. Well, people could argue against this point by saying that the world is not run by passion alone. Like, you need people to be working in the cubicle so that the word, world can run in order. I mean, I don't think anyone dreams about working in a cubicle, right? Like, I'm going to study for four years and then I'm going to sit in the box for the next 40 years of my life. Woo! Yeah. Set for life. <laughs> but no, it doesn't work like yeah, that. Yeah. But we still need people to do that. And people who are usually follow passions, especially in music, in art, in sports, they only see the success stories. Like that one percent who made it. Like there was this guy from I'm not sure, I think it's Uganda or somewhere, where he learned javelin throw by watching YouTube. How lucky did he get by just doing that? And he went to the Olympics. Lucky. Exactly. But what about the 99% that failed? So many people have had uh, um, promising careers, but they couldn't make it. Because in this world, luck is required. People see Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, but they don't see how lucky they were, how many opportunities they had. All of these guys were Harvard dropouts. And can I also add to that, when you, when you said about opportunities that they had, you, you can't want to do something and expect opportunities to come look for you. Yeah, to look for them. You want something, you go look for opportunities. I remember there was, I can't remember uh, where I heard this, but there was this guy who was just standing, um, he's a car guard, mm -hmm. and he was just being polite, doing what he does every day, and um, this man came and parked his car, so he was just like um, showing him how and just helping him. So when the man got out of the car, he was like, Thank you, sir. And he tipped the car guard. 
But then from the chat, the conversation started. And he asked him, what, why are you here? Like, don't you want to do anything in your life? And it's like, I have so many plans, but because of lack of finance and I don't know how to get there, um, opportunity is knocked at my door. But because he went out, because he knew that although I can't achieve that, I still have to do something, even if it's not my passion. He met someone and that man said, tell me about your plans. See, that guy had plans even though he didn't know how to achieve it yet. And that man that he met actually financed all his plans and they were all successful. But you can't deny the fact that luck is required in all this. Obviously. Not everybody's luck. But you can't sit at home watching TV, playing PlayStation and expect luck. I mean, yeah, exactly. But you may have, you may have talent, talent, but it's not always that everyone can become Justin Bieber. Obviously. Right. <laughs> no one wants to become Justin Bieber. Say, uh, I'm good, but... Luck is, <laughs> luck is something that you keep on telling yourself. Like, if you see, like, if you get, like, successful, you'll be like, oh, I, I got lucky. I wasn't lucky. Saying, I worked hard. And you're like, yeah, no, you worked hard, of course. And then you see, like, oh, I was so unlucky. But you know? what is the coincidence that Usher managed to find Justin Bieber? What if he found someone else? You see, that's the thing. I, I personally don't believe in luck. All yeah, right. right. However, I do think if you're passionate about something, something. you have to work towards that, that direction. Yeah. Because Justin Bieber could have been no one. Exactly. Yeah. But I still don't believe it was luck. And for instance, oh. like Justin Bieber, he has the talent and everything. But if he just said, oh, okay, obviously seeing playing his guitar, didn't make YouTube videos. Do you think that luck, luck would have come knocking at his door? No. No. Yeah. But he made videos, he posted it on his social platform because he knew that maybe some, or maybe he didn't even think of someone might spot him, but obviously someone did. What about the millions others who have been doing that? Why that, weren't they seen? I think that's, that it all comes down to why children still go back and follow their parents' right. dreams, right? Because A, the market, like the music industry, the fashion mm -hmm. industry is already saturated. There's like a yeah. lot of people in there. So, for example, if I'm passionate about music, I'm going to think twice. If I'm just going to sit here and like start working on my music, what are the chances of me actually making it in that industry? And to right. add to that is that, yeah. that in, like you said, the industry is saturated. But my thing is, you can't, you can't uh, want to do something, go in an industry that's saturated and still do the same thing. That's where uniqueness comes in. Exactly. in if I'm going to go and be a fashion designer, everyone's designing everything. Mm -hmm. But I have to go in there with a brilliant idea. Like, I know what I want. No designer has done this before. And from that, I'm going to know that once I do this, people are going to, I'm going to attract their attention and they'll want to know more about me. Do you understand? So you can't go in and be doing the same thing because then yeah, what's, really. what's, the, what's the use of it? Like you're not going to attract people's attention by doing what everyone else is doing. And that's why most of the people don't make it in saturated industries because mm -hmm they're doing the same thing and people want different they want you they don't want what everyone else is doing i mean like you know you could always keep your passion to the side and work on it you didn't do you know liam neeson right he used to be a teacher oh. and then from after he was he got fired from being a teacher then he became an actor oh. same with hugh jackman he was also a pe teacher so these guys went the normal route which everyone went but they all also kept their passions alive on the side. There's no one stopping you from saying, all right, you'd be an accountant, but you can do art on the side, like you get yeah. Saturday Sundays off, make some art. You know, you could just post it online or something like that. Someone will see you and then from there. So what I was trying to say is, everyone needs financial stability at the start. Yeah. When you start, you start out with nothing or whatever your parents give you, but you need something that is reliable, but keep your passion alive on the side. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to um, end the conversation, but I think it's so important. Like the last word that I want to have on this is that even if you're doing something that your parents want you to be doing, even if you're studying a major that you are doing because your parents think that it's um, going to make you more money or because they're being pragmatic about the fact that maybe you won't be able to find a job in another industry, I would just encourage students to just keep your passion alive. Yeah. And because you never know, like we've talked about in this conversation, when you have an opportunity to make that passion a reality. And if you don't pr mentally prepare yourself and keep working towards your passion, even if you are studying something else, then I think you will never be able to take that opportunity when it presents itself. Our last topic today is about boys.
borders. Are they necessary? What is their role? And how should we move forward? Are they something that we should continue to have, or should we get rid of them? Let's turn it over to our hosts. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> who wants to take so, the first uh, all right. opinion? So, anyone knows why do we have borders in the first place? You don't. <laughs> so basically, it, this is a natural human instinct of ours. Ever since the prehistoric eras where humans used to be tribe animals, we, we are social animals and we tend to prefer to be in tribes. You can see it right now also. We, can, we relate more with people who we associate with. So I think the pro, from small tribes, we started to expand more and more. And depending on the resources and the culture formed, we started creating these man-made borders. It also helped that, you know, some nature-made borders like mountains, uh, islands, and all that helped create um, these borders. Moreover, there was another thing where the development of Europe. Europe was much, much more faster developing than the world, and they started exp exploring more, which was, you know, the exploring age. And they imposed borders on other countries that weren't fully, you know, developed with their borders yet especially countries like India, where we did not have any borders in the start. These states, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Sri Lanka, used to be part of India. But these borders were imposed by Europeans, so that it could be easier to c control them. You know, the same, divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. So, hence, after the breakdown of the European Empire and all that, borders stuck around because people were so used to their lives over there and they formed their own cultures especially you can see this in african cultures where you know there are people who used to be from the same tribe around a hundred years ago but then after the europeans came in and separated them tribes were at war because sure. what cultures were made creative and then once they're separated they start to develop differences and exactly i think borders also just something that you know just how you don't want someone to get into your personal space mm -hmm. That's also for countries who don't want another country just getting into your space and coming in. We, we become protective. Exactly. And also another thing with borders is I think countries should have it because it, if countries didn't have borders, that means that anyone can just come and obviously it's going to be, it's going to cause conflict. Because countries can just come and claim land that isn't yours. Like for instance, Namibia has a strip and that part, it's called the Caprivi region, and that part was, there was back in the days, uh, people from Zambia, if I'm not mistaken, they were actually claiming that part because it kind of goes into Zambia, but it's not part of it. So uh, they would come and literally kill people and claim that that is part of them, but it's not. And that's where I think borders are really sufficient because it just, it, uh, how can I say it? It blocks unnecessary conflict yeah. and it brings like a sense of at least a sense of order yes. yeah. and definitely. organization to the different countries but if it comes to vacation i would definitely say countries should not have <laughs> so, i would, well, I would okay. say um if there weren't any borders right just think about how many people from africa would actually go to the u.s because people do believe the u.s is the land of so many opportunities and like what would what would happen to the country, like Zambia, for example, if a lot of people actually have right. the financial means to go to the U.S., what's going to happen to the country? Because the argument is that if borders were to open completely, then the people who maybe have businesses in, in that place or they are like a really smart uh, generation of new people with new ideas, then they all move to another part of the world. And then the people that are left there who maybe don't have enough financial uh assets to be able to go to another place right. and make a new life for themselves, then they, they have even less people there yeah. to influence and develop that country. I mean, Do we think that that's a legitimate concern? If you look at it though, it goes both ways, because Africa has got so many minerals there, so people from wherever, wherever whether it's Europe China. or like the US or like China, they are going to actually go right. to get what they want and don't leave it. But that's the problem is that a lot of, that's like a, a history that has happened in Africa is that people have come, taken the resources, but then the people who actually live there haven't benefited to them because they just come, colonize, and then take the resources. It's still happening today. I mean, another thing is like, they're gonna be, it's going to be really hard to adapt to this 
Imagine you're in a country of 60 million people and you're going to find a job over there and you have to learn something. You learn the same as 60 million people, so you're competing against 60 million people. Imagine all these borders are abolished. You're competing against 8 billion people to find a single job. Imagine how hard that would be. People from so many different cultures, backgrounds, educations, they have learned different things from you. And to make it a fair competing ground, you have to learn the same things as them. How many cultures do you imagine you have to learn to fit in, to manage to be able to work in? It's going to be really hard to fit in in the first place. Plus, like, and plus managing 8 billion people at a time, how can, how can it be possible? You need to separate it and control them one at a time. It's not possible to control such a huge amount of people. I think best examples of these are like empires. The bigger the empire gets, the harder it is to control them. In the end, what happens? It collapses. But in terms of culture, don't you think like it's nowadays it's way too easier to understand what other people's culture with the internet? You can literally just like connect with them on Facebook and just you can just start like talking to them and you just they will talk talk about their culture. So I don't think it's like hard to understand the culture. But so, like uh, plus with that that happened to Namibia, but like um, like Israel. Mm. Israel wasn't a country at all. Then uh, like a group of people I don't want to say the name because it, it might like offend some people. Oh. I'm not against them. So they come to <laughs> Palestine and then they took it and they also like like what uh, President Trump wants to do to Mexico, they also did it in that country. Now that there is no country as Palestine anymore, it just is right. Yeah. Mm. But so then, it, they just destroyed the country. <laughs> There's like a difference with um, like understanding someone's culture and actually accepting it. Mm, yeah. You know, you can't understand someone's culture, but will you accept it? You know, it's kind of like, you know, it, it next, depends on individuals. No, it's kind of like, you know, your next door neighbor, like let's say you're living next to an Indian family and they start cooking all these smelly foods. You're of course not going to like it. You're like, okay, I understand your culture. You have to use curry leaves, you have to use spices, but it irritates me. I'm not used to this culture. There's a big difference in, in knowing and getting accustomed to it. Integration. And yes, thank you. And especially with the rapid modernization of the world, I think the predominant culture is the American culture, the Western culture. And for, for judging by the way it's spreading through the world right now, many places are trying to go against it also because it's trying, you're losing culture with it. That's true. People, and yeah, sorry. The thing with borders also now is, now that I'm thinking about it is, what if uh, countries did not have border, borders with um, the different um, tribes and so would they would they have embraced who they are because like with previously when countries were colonized and I'm speaking right now about Namibia um, the one group um, group the Hereros they are really influenced by the German people you can see it in the traditional uh, attire but so now that I'm thinking is if they were still under that influence would this group of people be able to embrace and, you know, just be who they are? Or would they have had to change their um, culture, their customs to more of the German way? Because if you look in Namibia, there are a lot of tribes, there are a lot of different people. And you can see that everywhere you go because of the borders. And I just think that if these borders were taken away, um, it would have been more of a modern situation than this is who we are type of situation. The problem is humans can be influenced really easily in the name of power, religion, conflict. Best case, in my opinion, India-Pakistan thing was a religion-based separation. The Britishers came, they put a conflict in between the Hindu and Muslims. Muslims got angry, separated from the Hindus. How Bangladesh and Pakistan came. Like, if the Britishers didn't come in the first place, that wouldn't have been any conflict at all. We were living in harmony together, but people can be so easily manipulated by the things they believe in so strongly. Like if I were to just come out and say like, Jesus Christ was dark skin, I'm not saying that, you know, anything, but if I were to say that, there are people who are going to get enraged by it. And there are going to be people who are going to be in support of me. And this is going to, this, I could use it to start an argument and separate this group of people. Even though they all are Christians, 
they fight against each other. Same thing, even though we all were from the subcontinent, South, Southern Asia, we got divided. That's how people get influenced so easily. And that's how like borders are created. I think one of the best examples of having borders yet being open was the European Union. Free trade laws, free work, but we keep our borders because of culture. And another thing to consider also, especially now, is that there are a lot of cases where people in from certain countries, there's a lot of conflict in those countries, yeah. or there are not enough jobs for people to be able to support their families, or there's a lot of um, violence in those countries. And so, in my opinion, a problem that we're having now is that the, like nobody from the more developed countries, which also have problems, are willing to take those people in because they, they were saying, there's like rhetoric that's saying, okay, we have enough problems in our own country, much less trying to take people from other countries. So that's where you get things like what's happening in the US and my country right now, where Trump is um, literally you know taking people from that were supposed to be dreamers and things like that, or people that are coming over. I understand that there has to be some kind of border control, but then the use of like taking the kids away from the parents is just despicable to me. And then also like just the way that it's being handled uh, by that administration and also to see like that the people that are coming over aren't coming over just because they want to. Just because, oh yeah, we just decided we're gonna come across the border. It's because they have so many problems in their country. So I think people need to understand that, that people don't just come, don't just want to come to a different country because they, woke up one day and said, oh, it would be yeah. super Fun. swell if we went to this country. It's like, no, there's literally sometimes for people it's life and death. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really important to, to, as a final note for this topic, to realize that there are many reasons why borders are important, as we've discussed, but then there are other reasons why I think we need to be empathetic and think about why people want to maybe come into a different place. So that's where we'll end the conversation today. Thank you everyone so much for watching the ID show. We're so happy that everyone is watching from Stanford. We really appreciate the support and we hope you watch the next episode. Bye! Hey everyone, looking for some more hot content? Then you should subscribe if you don't. You'll miss out on, on all this. Subscribe, like, and comment. The Pinky Show. Bye bye. Pinky Show.